everybody. Welcome to the Brain Talk webinar. Brain Talk webinar is an online platform where scientists, researchers, and early stage researchers have an opportunity to present their research work, which is related to machine learning and computational science. I am Sajjad Ahmadi from University of Oslo. It gives me a great pleasure to co-chair this webinar with Moin Nagavi from Simula Research Laboratory and Gadi al Haj from University of Oslo, Faculty of Mathematics and National Sciences. I would like to give this stage to Moi. Uh, thank you, uh, Sajjad. Uh, today we have two interesting presentations. Um, after each presentation, we will have a question and answer session, and audiences can post their questions on YouTube uh, live streaming. Uh, the first presentation will be given by Federica Guillaume. Uh, Federica received her master's degree in applied geology from the University of Pavia uh, in 20, uh, from Italy. In 2019, she began uh, working as a seismologist for, for Nurstar company in Norway. Uh, in 2020, she started her PhD at the University of Oslo in collaboration with Nurstar, uh, NGU and Oslo Komune on a project called GeoBiobit, uh, which is geodata-based machine learning for real-time urban risk reduction systems. Uh, her PhD project is linked to seismic uh, risk assessment for the city of Oslo. Uh, her interests uh, include seismic hazard and risk and uh, geohazards. Hello, Hello, Patrika. Patrika. Uh, the floor, the floor is, is yours. yours. We are yeah, looking forward to your presentation. Thanks a lot for the introduction. So I hope it can now conclude the presentation. Uh, so, uh, yes, today I will talk about my, my work uh, that is in the final building of the classification in machine learning at the study of Norway. And, and this work has been recently uh, published in June of this year in Frontiers in Earth Science in uh, this uh, um, special research topic called New Challenges for Science Risk Mitigation in Urban Area. And uh, uh, in, in, on the top, you can see the list of the, um, of the authors that contribute in the paper. And, and my, my colleague, uh, Stefan, uh, he, he, he is the one that developed the, the code uh, for the machine learning. And uh, uh, my part was mainly also to um, gather all the data and also um, perform the, the application of this method with my, my data. So, uh, the uh, in context of my presentation today uh, is uh, I, will start, I will start talking about the my PhD project. Uh, then I will give you some background information. Uh, I will go through the study area and the methodology that I use for, for my study. And then I will go through the results and conclusions at the end. Uh, so, so now, now I want just to give you some uh, few, few words on the, the PhD project that is in connection of the GeoIT uh, project, the Ministry of the Bay Machine Learning for Real-Time Urban Risk Reduction System. It is a four-year project and is founded by the Research Council of Norway. Uh, this uh, uh, project has uh, three uh, main uh, working packages. Uh, the first one was to improve uh, the detection of seismic events in the Oslo, Oslo area. Uh, also, um, using the new uh, seismic, uh, seismic station in, in, the, in the area. The second working package was to improve uh, the detection and the characterization of lineaments in, in the area. And the third working package wants to combine these two, um, two new data uh, together to have some uh, seismic hazard and risk assessment for all of The partners included in this project are NOSR, Public Union, the NGU, and the University of Oslo. And I'm personally involved as a PhD in this project, and the title of my project is Seismic Risk Assessment for uh, So now I just uh, I mentioned seismic, uh, seismic risk, uh, but usually people um, 
these are the extent the risk to the hazard. So it does clarify when I talk about cyber hazard, hazard, we want to stress the probability that the potential damage in the earthquake can occur in an area in a specific time. And when, when we are talking about seismic risk, we are talking about the probability of losses due to uh, this specific earthquake that has happened in a specific area and in a specific time. So seismic risk is uh, connected to losses that can be uh, human life, social, and economic losses. A typical example to understand this uh, true concept is that if we have an earthquake with a certain magnitude in a desert area, uh, the seismic risk uh, in this case will be zero because we don't have any uh, people involved in this uh, in the earthquake, or also we don't have buildings that uh, are present in the area. So the risk will be zero. But if the same earthquake with the same magnitude occur in the middle of the city, in this case the risk will not be zero because we have the people involved and also buildings. So, so the risk, risk uh, when we think of the risk, risk uh, we need to think of take into account other components, vulnerability, and exposure uh, components. In, in this talk today, I will focus on particularly on the exposure uh, model. So uh, now, now moving to my, my, my work, work uh, like in the city, the study area uh, for, for my, my, my project. Is related to all the municipalities, so that you can see the picture. And in this picture, you can also see the distribution of all the buildings in Norway. And uh, in total, we have about 130,000 buildings uh, spread around the municipality. Um, and as an exposure model, usually, usually uh, it's uh, uh, made of uh, two main components that are population and buildings. Uh, to perform a seismic risk assessment, you need some uh, data that uh, needs to be collected from, uh, from the buildings. And this is usually uh, you need information about location, area of construction, occupancy, total, uh, total area of the building, the number of stories, and the construction material. Um, in the Oslo, uh, we have uh, all these source. Uh, into the data, data, but, but we, are we are lucky of the construction material of the building. And, and it is quite, quite common, common uh, not only in Norway, but also for, for other countries to meet this kind of data. And the common practice to gather this kind of information is to uh, do uh, some fieldwork uh, 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 and walk around the city and to collect manually uh, this information for each building. And it is, as you can guess, this kind of approach is the cost and really time consuming. So, with my um, during the talk, uh, I will present a new approach uh, to that it is supposed to save uh, time and also money. Uh, so, uh, and you see the much learning to do that. But of course, we need first to identify these uh, materials. And to do that, uh, we need to follow some 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 steps to develop uh, to understand the construction material that are used in the city. And also these construction materials are also called model building typology. And the first uh, thing that we can do is in the work that I did for Oslo is to have a first overview of the city using the color. So here you can just see a screenshot of, uh, of some building. So from Google Earth, we can already see um, the, we can kind of recognize the type of material that are used, so we can start to have an idea of the city. And this overview we can also combine with uh, the footprint of, uh, of the, the buildings. This kind of data we can obtain from uh, the Geonomia database, uh, in this case for Oslo. And also, we, we try to gather all the information that are available, public available for, for buildings. The second step is uh, um, after having uh, performed a personal level of work, we can focus in some specific area of the city to perform an in situ field work. So, in my case, I perform a uh, field work between January and April of last year. In those specific areas, so in the area and in the city center. 
And during this video, I put my own five on the picture with my phone. And then also I got the information about the structure, system, and material data. So these are some examples of the pictures that I do. And as you can see, uh, it's really important to try to um, capture the entire um, state uh, from bottom to, to the top. Uh, so after, after doing this, this, this field, field, field work, uh, I was able to uh, define uh, five uh, main topologies that were recognized in the city of Oslo. But to be sure that the, the those were the only ones that are existing in Oslo, I sent a survey questionnaire to some, um, some engineers. Here is just a, a some screenshot of, um, of the questionnaire that I sent out. And, uh, Unfortunately, uh, I received only two feedback, uh, eight, uh, from the presentation this question to one of the people, but I received only eight feedback. But at least these, uh, those eight feedback were in accordance to each other. And they confirmed my initial, um, initial definition of the five, uh, healing psychologies. So after that, I was able to finalize those psychologies that you can see in, in this slide. So this is the timber building. The second one is the unknown force masonry. Then we have the reinforced concrete, uh, the composite that is a combination of steel and reinforced concrete. And the uh, fifth uh, psychology is uh, the steel one. In addition to these five, uh, another category that is uh, I call other and was added after. And this is include all the pictures that uh, we were not able to classify because in front of the picture we have some uh, trees or uh, construction uh, sites that they cover the main facade. So in this case, we then we add this uh, extra um, category. And uh, like, like I said at the beginning, uh, usually to have a total overview of, um, of the city, uh, it's a common, uh, common thing to do is just to walk around and gather all this information. Um, but my idea was to do this kind of automatically to, uh, to have more detail uh, and also less time consuming for the entire city. So I started to do some uh, literature review and I found just only this example in the literature and this is a paper from uh, 2020 where they use uh, machine learning to automatically detect, detect uh, the different building psychology for a city in, in Colombia. So uh, I, I wanted to try all this method again for Colombia. So here, here you can see the workflow work that was followed uh, for, for this work. So at the beginning, um, I collected images, uh, both from uh, phone during my field work and also from Google Street View. Uh, after that, I manually labeled all those pictures that in total were about 5,000 images uh, with the correct building um, technology. Then, then we, we train a classifier, and in parallel, we download, download uh, other images that are used to be classified uh, from Google Street View. And at the end, we were uh, using machine learning. We were uh, able to automatically, automatically uh, classify and label all the images. Um, like, like our, our um, starting input, input data, data is, is a kind of, of uh, um, catalog uh, downloaded from the market, market where we have a list of all uh, the buildings with their corresponding uh, 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 building number, number and the coordinates. And from there, uh, we were able to download uh, all the images that were available, available for those uh, images using the whole uh, map uh, Ideally, it uh, would be good to have these uh, 100 images uh, for each, uh, each psychology. And, uh, uh, and also, it's also, it's also nice to combine images from uh, um, Google Street View and Figure to have a higher uh, quality resolution uh, with the images. 
Um, but we need to think what are important sounds that the, the, those images need to be uh, similar because they need to have the same kind of uh, um, information in the image. So also the angle where the, the, the image was took is also important. So and then uh, at the end, uh, almost 5,000 images were manually labeled. And in here, you can see some examples from the Google CPU uh, images. So the first one is a good image because we have the entire facade on the physical. But then the other two are not that good because uh, the second one, we have a tree that uh, is in front of the building, so we are not able to recognize the uh, quality. And the third one is also not, uh, not good because we have uh, two different typologies uh, in the same picture. So in this case, we have a timber building with an reinforcement on the building. So also this kind of picture are not, uh, are not good. Um, but uh, the, the advantage of using the Google CPU uh, images is that we don't need to perform um, field work. So that is really um, can save us a lot of money and time. But, but there, there are also some, some uh, disadvantages, and this is due to the fact that if we want to download a lot of images at the same time, it can be quite expensive. And then also the, the, um, the quality of the image cannot can be um, not that good. So uh, regarding the image recognition, uh, we use a convolutional neural network to classify the building type from a from an image. Uh, we use a pre-trained uh, model, uh, and this uh, is the advantage to using a pre-trained model is that it's already available for us, and also this can also um, save time because it's uh, saving time instead of starting from, from scratch. And also we uh, applied a sample learning because we adapted the previous model by retraining some, some parts of our images. So uh, in our case, uh, we tested 11 architecture, and uh, at the end we used uh, the dense net with one with one model that was retrained in on the image net that I said. Um, like, like, like I said before, uh, 5,000 images were uh, labeled manually, and uh, like 20% of those images were used for the uh, test of that set. And here, here you on, on, the, on this slope, you can see the computer matrix computed on the test uh, uh, data set. And on the row, uh, you can see the two plots, and on the follow loop, you can see the, the Predictive uh, typology. So if you follow the, the row, the sum needs to be uh, one. So for example, if you are focusing on the, the timber plot, that is as the one that they gave us the best score, we can see that 89% of the images were uh, classified as timber. So that is the true plot. In the parentheses, we can see the real number of, of images. So, like in this case, we had quite a few uh, 424 images that were classified in Europe. But if we want to see the worst class, it is uh, composite, so CLA or post composite uh, class, where we can see only 35% uh, of the images were um, predicted uh, correctly. And 60% were attributed to wrongly, and it was assigned to the uh, uh, root concrete class. And these can find two uh, explanations. Uh, the first one is that we didn't have many pictures uh, in, for this class. So in this case, we were only like 10 pictures, and it is 12. And also because this is a composite class, it's quite difficult also for a human expert to um to identify correctly so then uh, um it, we understand why this class uh, was recognized as um another interesting thing that you can see from, from this plot is that in the other uh, category 
uh, uh, eight seven percent was uh, was uh, uh, predicted as other, so that is good. But twelve percent was recognized as senior. And this um, is due to the fact that uh, many of the teachers that are in the other category sometimes they have fences uh, in the front of the picture or like some parked cars. And these are usually uh, some features that are um, uh, recognized in residential areas. And in residential residential areas, residential areas, we have mainly uh, timber buildings. So this is the reason why we have these 12% here. Um, going to, to, to the results, uh, here you can see the spatial um, distribution of the predicted typology for outlook. And uh, uh, with the black dots here, you can see uh, where we didn't have a Google Street images uh, uh, available. And the location of those are, as if you know, all the areas, they are located in the forest area. So also for these, uh, these, these dots, uh, black dots, we can think that it's a timber technology. Uh, but, but those black dots uh, are almost 26% of the total number of buildings, which is quite a lot. Um, but for the remaining percentage, uh, more than half uh, of the buildings are uh, timber. So this is the main uh, typology that is represented in you know. Uh, we did also some kind of validation uh, of the results. So uh, we took some uh, parts of, of the city and we checked if the um, what we see on Google Earth is uh, comparable with uh, the prediction that we have using the machine learning. So in this case, uh, all the typology that we can see in this image figure are, are uh, correctly classified from. Um, uh, to conclude, um, so we did work, um, work um, we want to develop uh, the first computer model driven psychology using Oslo as a case study. Uh, we also um, uh, proved that combining computational neural network and uh, Google's first few images can contribute in terms of developing a cost-effective feeling stock model for seismic risk assessment. And also we think that those building psychologies that we, we recognize in Oslo can be uh, applicable in other uh, North cities, not only in Oslo, but also in the, North, in the other North countries, with or without additional training. Thank you for the attention. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much uh, Patrika. Patrika. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, indeed very, very interesting presentation. Um, uh, there, there are like a few things uh, that, that I would like to uh, ask regarding the uh, presentation. So um, okay. first of all, like, uh, can you tell us a bit more, like, which kind of topologies are more at risk to this uh, seismic risk uh, activity? Like, uh, are there like some pros and cons in terms of uh, uh, which type of topology a city has? Yes, uh, I mean, one, the, the one that is uh, more critical is the timber one, and it's also the, the, the one that you can see is, is, yeah, is more spread around Oslo. Uh, but, but also it's important to take into account to remember the year of construction because if, if we have a timber building that were uh, built after the introduction of the air for the aim, that is uh, law to build according to the seismic taking into account of the design. Um, so so then, then it takes. So we need to work to see the year of construction of those buildings. Nice. Um, uh, also, I was wondering uh, around the idea that, uh, like, do you think if we add um, data from more sources, like sources other than images, like, for example, publicly available data uh, about the buildings, uh, do you think that will help in, uh, for example, a better prediction uh, in terms of what type of topology a building can have? 
Yes, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, but we want to start really uh, with easy data, kind of, kind of, to see if the method was working. And uh, so we saw that there is potential. So then this can be done in the future. Yeah. Um, are, are there, there some, some other questions? questions? I, I, I can, can go off of that. Uh, about, uh, you had a nice table, Federica, uh, about uh, 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 predictions before the results. Uh, would you please, yeah. Uh, here, uh, you have presented yeah, you had just some images from one type of buildings and 76 from other type of buildings. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering in your model, have you added any hyperparameter to uh, uh, increase the score of these predictions or, or not? Just because you have imbalanced data. You have not. Yes, I, I know. We already also I remember that we discussed about this previously, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, uh, we didn't give this one before. Uh, so this is also like a potential improvement in the future. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm done. I have no question. Gadi, go for a question. Yeah, yeah I, have I have actually some comments, comments on the same slide. It's, it's just, just like, like interesting, interesting to see the explanations behind, behind why. You have, have these different, different uh, performances. Like, like if I might still know why your model is not performing well on specific classes. classes. Uh, I, I have, have one question about the architectures. Should you just, just comment a bit on the other architectures, architectures that you have tried, other than Yes, uh, now I cannot remember the list, but to be honest, be in the paper. They have the list. But now I don't remember. Okay, yeah, I see. And, and one, one another other question, question related to the um, class that has a few images. images. Have you tried like to maybe data augmentation just like to uh, increase the number of images, or is that something on the? Yes, I mean, uh, yes, like we, because at the beginning there were uh, even a few images, uh, so the core uh, was, I would say, kind of, yeah, the same. <laughs> Because, because anyway, we have about really few images. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. It's for the, the worst class, class it's about the yeah, asset as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not many anyway. anyway. So, yeah, yeah and this is uh, definitely a yeah, future improvement for the model. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think we are, are uh, done. I'll give you a presentation. The stage is yours, Gadi. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. you. So, so now, now we will move, move to our next speaker, uh, Owen Hopp. So, so Owen is an industrial PhD candidate, candidate in geophysics at the uh, uh, and, and the University of Oslo, where he does research in machine learning methods applied to seismic processing and interpretation. Owen received a bachelor's degree in physics from Western Illinois University in 2018 and a master's degree in geophysics from Colorado School of Mines in 2021. His master's thesis was about fiber optic micro seismic monitoring of hydraulic fracturing and the analysis of guided waves in trade reservoirs. He has interned at several universities, such as the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Freeport McMoran on topics varying from condensed matter physics to geophysics to data science. And with that, I would like to move the floor to you, Owen, who will share your presentation, please. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I need to, uh, 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 Frederica, can you stop your screen share, please? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I can everyone see my presentation all right? Okay, okay cool. cool. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So, so uh, my, my presentation, presentation will be on the uh, automatic refining of normal move out and static corrections for angle stack data or exploration seismic data. 
So uh, this is a bit of a uh, specialized uh, topic within uh, geophysics and seismology. So I have to uh, spend a little bit of time giving some background on a reflection seismology for uh, oil exploration. So uh, the basic idea of reflection seismology, um, in the case of marine data, we have a uh, ship that uh, trails a cables of uh, receivers and um, air guns that um, send uh, explosive pulses to send seismic waves down through the water. And then they transmit through uh, layers of the earth and reflect off of um, changes in rock layers. And then, our, uh, then they travel back up through the water to the uh, receivers and essentially you record all of the seismic data from reflections off different rock layers. And there are uh, thousands of different um, shots that are made for uh, each of these seismic sources and um, thousands of records of uh, each of these shots from all the receivers that are towed along on these surveys that go for many, many kilometers. So by measuring the, uh, the wave of amplitude as a function of time and position from uh, all this uh, seismic data, essentially we can construct uh, an image of the subsurface that looks something like this. Um, and a lot of these concepts are pretty similar to uh, medical imaging, such as uh, CT scans and MRIs, where you want to uh, essentially image something you uh, can't see by using waves. Now, with, with all this uh, seismic data, data, there's uh, different, different ways to uh, gather it and, and sort it. So um, there are uh, all these different uh, gathers. In, for, for instance, there's called a uh, common shot gather, which is where you take um, all the data that's received from a particular shot or particular uh, release of energy. It's on the opposite side of that, you have a common receiver gather, which takes all the um, all the different shots that correspond to the data recorded at one receiver. There's also a uh, common offset uh, gather, which um, takes which gathers up all the reflections that have the same offset between them. And then finally, there's called the common midpoint gather which basically focuses on imaging a single uh, midpoint in the X dimension um, and uh, measures all the different uh, angles that reflect off of that midpoint. And when you um, take all these common midpoints and uh, combine them as a function of uh, time or depth going downwards, you get these uh, common midpoint gathers. So this is an example of what a common midpoint gather looks like on the right. Now, um, there's an interesting thing um, with these uh, gathers and how they represent the subsurface. So if you think about uh, a seismic wave reflecting off of a rock layer, a flat rock layer, um, in terms of the, the time that it takes to reach the reflection point and come back, that curve of travel time is actually going to be um, a hyperbola. Now, uh, this is a problem for constructing an image because in this case, we want a uh, flat curve that represents the geological reality of a, a flat rock layer. So this is what, on the left, is what a uh, travel time curve for reflection would look like normally, but we have to apply something called the normal move out correction, which is a hyperbolic equation that um, accounts for this, that corrects this um, hyperbolic shift in travel time using the uh, offset value X and the velocity of the rock layers B. And if you apply this correctly, then you get a um, NMO corrected flat travel time curve that represents a flat uh, rock layer. Now, the thing is, um, in using seismic data, we often only also 
have access to stacks of certain angular offsets. So these, instead of using these uh, full gathers like back here, um, we use uh, divisions of these gathers into angular offsets. And that's because if you reuse the, the full gathers, they require um, much more uh, data and memory. And it's also because um, uh, when you have this angle stack data, it's useful for studying the amplitude variations with uh, angle or offset. Um, and those are often used to um, identify fluid content in the rocks that's present. Um, the, and that show the AVA responses. So this is how they find uh, oil and gas. But essentially, um, the data that uh, we're going to be working with, I'm going to be working with this presentation, is angle stack data. So these are uh, single traces that are an average response for an angular range. So like this blue or this uh, purple um, range is called the, uh, the near offset. Um, which is an uh, angular range from about 6 to 18 degrees in this example. The uh, middle is called the mid offset from uh, 18 to 28 degrees, and the far is from uh, 28 to 36 degrees in green. So uh, this is the type of uh, data we work with in practice. But uh, there's a, a problem with this uh, data that often presents itself in angle stack. So um, they can show uh, significant uh, misalignments and distortion due to incorrect uh, normal move out. So um, if you remember this uh, normal move out equation of the hyperbola, you need to use the uh, offset and the velocity. So uh, the offset is uh, no problem, but the velocity we're trying to uh, you know, you, you don't, don't exactly, exactly know, know what velocities are of, of these rocks uh, very deep below the subsurface. So if you're using uh, incorrect velocities, which is very common, um, then these uh, curves are not going to be flat. So um, looking at this uh, CMP gather for the uh, near, mid, and far offsets, <clears throat> we are uh, looking at this, um, this uh, reflector we can see it's uh, shifting down significantly by about uh, 30 uh, milliseconds. So uh, what this corresponds to, um, if you uh, take this uh, travel time and multiply it by uh, the average velocity of uh, wave propagating sandstone, so like uh, 3,000 meters per second, um, you would get 100 meters in, uh, in depth uncertainty. So, Essentially, uh, the, the image will be uh, distorted and you uh, have this uh, incorrect response where uh, ideally it's uh, a much flatter layer, but the data is uh, incorrectly telling you that uh, as you go to far offset, the, uh, the layer is uh, essentially shifted down by 100 meters. And the, the consequence, consequence of this is when you take all this uh, angle stack data and combine it in a, a seismic section, you get um, lower seismic resolution in these areas with, uh, with misaligned reflectors. Because uh, when, they're, when the reflectors are ideally aligned, you get a much uh, sharper image as you go across. So the uh, solution uh, that I'm uh, developing to solve this problem is to uh, utilize uh, deep learning techniques for uh, signal to signal uh, transformation. So there are uh, lots of um, uh, techniques using uh, convolutional neural networks, um, especially uh, UNETs, for uh, transforming uh, signals and images from um, an input that is uh, uh, a bad example and a target, which is a good example, and um, training a network to go from the bad to the good and then applying it to real data. So um, we can uh, create uh, synthetic examples of uh, angle stacks that have poor alignment and distortion, 
and conversely uh, create uh, ideal synthetic examples that are um, that show these uh, flat uh, move out corrections. So essentially, the idea is to train a unit to go from the, uh, the bad uh, synthetic angle stack examples to the good ones and then apply to field data. So the uh, synthetics that I generate, so um, first you have to generate uh, full uh, CMP gathers. Um, this is generated with a code um, or uh, using a one-dimensional uh, reflectivity method. So the basic idea of this is you send down, um, you use uh, plane waves and randomize uh, their uh, reflection coefficients and uh, essentially with lots of randomization of the parameters such as uh, the amplitudes and the uh, seismic frequencies that you send down, you get all these uh, gathers, uh, CMP common endpoint gathers. Um, now, the, uh, but the main difference between the uh, integrating this uh, training data is uh, for our inputs, which are the, uh, the bad ones, we are going to apply NMO correction in parentheses with uh, wrong velocities. So um, if you remember uh, back in those uh, slides talking about normal move out, if it's, um, if it's uh, the wrong, if you don't apply the right velocity, then the, um, the curves for the reflectors will be bending down or up uh, significantly. Uh, so, so the way we, we do that is by uh, perturbing the velocity um, from minus 1 to 1% 1 1 um, and uh, applying it to all these reflectors. And then we have all these uh, input uh, bad examples that um, have these shifted reflectors. Uh, but then we use the uh, correct velocities uh, to, in the NMO correction for the targets. So uh, for the same reflector down here, you can see you apply the correct velocity, and then it's uh, flat going across. So this is an example of the target that then we want to train the network to um, bring the data towards. Um, so once we've uh, generated those um, uh, synthetic uh, CMP gathers, um, and divide them into uh, angle stacks. So the, the uh, angle, angle stacking uh, process involves um, using an, an angular angle mute to uh, divide the CMP gather into um, the angular angle offsets from for near, mid, and, and far. So these are the uh, angular ranges that I described earlier. Um, and you uh, then with these uh, angle, with these they're called the angle gathers. You uh, stack the um, uh, stack the responses for um, all the amplitudes within that gather. So uh, stacking is like a geophysical term, basically just for averaging, uh, for summing, averaging um, the response. So by stacking, you get um, a, a singular trace that's essentially the uh, average uh, average response. Uh, so, so going across, we have um, a near, a mid, and a far stack uh, for the, the inputs on the top and for the targets on the bottom. So uh, now you can see um, for the, the input uh, triplet going from near to mid to far, this uh, reflector is uh, shifting down. Well, for the uh, target, it is uh, staying uh, flat. Um, so we create um, uh, 8,000 uh, pairs of uh, input and target triplets like this uh, for training, uh, 2,000 of them for validation, and uh, 2,000 for testing. So now we have all this uh, training data. Um, now, in uh, developing the network, um, I decided to use a, a unit architecture, uh, except using um, one-dimensional convolutions 
since I'm uh, working with these um, uh, one, one D uh, uh, traces, uh, records of amplitude and time. Um, now, now the, the, the length, length of these traces um, is referred to as C because it can be adjusted for a um, different data set. Um, but in uh, my example, I use uh, traces of uh, 960 time samples long at four millisecond uh, sampling interval. Now, um, essentially, the, um, the uh, architecture of the network is to import a uh, input trace that is input uh, triplet of traces that's distorted, and then it passes through uh, the UNet architecture, um, which consists of these convolutional filters and uh, max cooling operations. Um, and then once it goes, uh, once it's um, downsampled, it's uh, Upsampled up again, um, and with, with uh, connections and uh, concatenations, uh, transferring the uh, frequency information across, and the uh, output comes here at the uh, final output layer. Um, now, once the, uh, now the the loss metric that the network is trying to use to learn is the uh, mean square error, so. The, uh, yeah, this, this is, is where, where the, uh, the target um, traces come in. So, so we have the, the input traces and the target traces, and we, we want, want to minimize the uh, mean squared error between um, the uh, prediction and the target. And if we can minimize that, then that means uh, that the, the network is uh, learning to transform the, the, the input into the target. Um, now, uh, training this network uh, is pretty fast, um, only taking about uh, three minutes to uh, converge. Um, that's because these uh, one-dimensional convolution operations are uh, really fast compared to the, the 2D and 3D ones that are used for full images. So uh, now that we, uh, after that training of the, the, the network, um, I decided to, try, uh, to test it on uh, holdout uh, synthetic data. So these uh, are examples of um, a, uh, a full uh, CMP gather. That's, this is for the input, which is uh, uh, heavily distorted and has uh, incorrect NMO. So zooming in on this reflector, um, you can see it's um, bending down uh, significantly. And the uh, near, mid, and far angle stack for the <coughs> angle stack traces for the inputs are shown in this uh, dashed red. So you can see for the for the near, everything is uh, pretty much the same because uh, the NMO, um, improper NMO, uh, only causes the, the bending down when the velocity is really bad, bad at the far, at the, the mid and far offsets. So at the near, it's all the same pretty much. But as you go to the mid, you can see that this uh, input trace is uh, shifted down significantly. And the far, um, it's uh, shifted down a lot. Um, but the, the prediction um, training, which is uh, in blue, you can see that this, this is uh, very closely uh, replicating the, the target, which is in uh, orange. So uh, essentially, the, uh, the network is doing a good job on these uh, synthetic examples um, because it's transforming this uh, dash red um, trace, which is shifted down significantly into this um, flattened triplet of traces. Um, and uh, producing a, a flat response, which is what we want. And uh, this is another uh, example below for a, uh, a different reflector, um, but it's the same uh, phenomenon we're seeing.
Uh, so, so now, now to, to uh, quantify, quantify uh, this, this improvement, improvement um, I use the, uh, the correlation as a, a goodness of fit metric. metric. So the, the correlation of the, the R squared value um, between the, the input in the target um, and the prediction in the target. So now if it were a perfect uh, prediction, that would return an R squared value of 1. Um, so, so we can, can see, see the, the input, input with, with the target initially um, is only returning correlations of about uh, 0.48 and uh, 0 0.6 for these uh, two examples and uh, 0 0.69 for the uh, entire uh, testing set of 2,000 examples. But the uh, prediction, um, which is after the output of the, the network, um, improves the uh, correlation with the target to uh, 0.95 and 0.90 for these two examples and uh, 92 um, across the entire data set. So um, it's a very uh, significant uh, improvement in the, in the correspondence with, with the target. So that uh, tells us that the network is working pretty well. Um, so, so now, now we'll, we'll move to um, actually testing uh, this network on the field data. data. So, so we, we take, take um, near, mid, and far uh, angle stacks from uh, an area in the Norwegian North, North Sea. sea. Um, and this, this is, is the, uh, the full stack section, so um, what the total, total image looked look like. But we, we apply um, our trained uh, algorithm from the synthetics onto this field triplet of uh, near, mid, and far traces that are uh, extracted from, from every, every point um, along the section. And then we re-stack uh, across this section with the, uh, with the corrected traces to uh, try to improve the, uh, the resolution of the image. So that's what I'm going to show next. So, um, this, uh, I'll show examples to the near, the mid, and the far offset. So this is the um, original uh, near offset stack section and the corrected. So there isn't very much difference uh, between these. And that's because uh, this is the, the near offset where, which is, uh, which if you remember back to here, the, uh, the reflectors are, um, there isn't much a bending down um, occurring at the near offset. So we'd expect the, the near offset to be very similar um, for the input and uh, prediction. Now we move to the, the mid, mid offsets. So this is the uh, original and the prediction. So now we can see there's um, some improvement in the, uh, the resolution. So uh, the reflectors are becoming less blurred, uh, more focused. Uh, and now we move to the far offset. So uh, this is the uh, original far offset data and the uh, corrected far offset data. So you can see it's becoming a lot less blurry. And there's also uh, noise that's, um, so if you look here, there's uh, dipping noise, these lines, um, which uh, can be due to the uh, instrument response uh, or other, other factors, uh, which these aren't, uh, these don't represent anything um, geological, so. And they, they can, can be due to this misalignment. So, so removing those is, is good. good. So, so overall getting a very improved uh, seismic images. images. So, so now, now uh, looking uh, closer at the traces to uh, see what's, what's going, going on. on. So um, I extracted um, uh, some, some traces as an example uh, from this section here, um, focusing on this uh, on this layer. So essentially we have the, uh, the input again in uh, dash red. So you can see 
originally it's uh, shifted up by a significant amount, like uh, 10 milliseconds or so. So this uh, misalignment is uh, causing um, a distorted image, but um, the prediction uh, is uh, improving uh, the alignments and also correcting for um, some of this uh, destructive interference and uh, loss of frequency content that can occur at the far offsets uh, due to the improper NMO. Um, if you look at the overall um, amplitudes as a function of frequency, uh, we can see that the uh, amplitudes are still uh, pretty similar. Because ideally, we want to have the um, the amplitudes uh, be um, not changed too much because um, they're used for um, again this amplitude variation with offset analysis. So there is some uh, room for improvement um, in uh, my algorithm that I've uh, been working on recently um, in trying to make the uh, the data a bit more realistic so that it better uh, reconstructs the amplitudes, for instance, that uh, here this can be a bit lower, for example. So uh, the further work um, that I'm uh, working on right now is uh, making uh, synthetic data more similar to uh, field data. Um, so that can be done by uh, like including the uh, attenuation of seismic waves as they uh, propagate. Um, and by uh, potentially adding, adding noise or other aspects to make the, the synthetic data more realistic. And then I get uh, essentially better, uh, better uh, amplitude correspondence. Um, and also uh, another uh, further work task is to uh, compare um, the, uh, the time shifts and seeing do the corrections from the algorithm with well log data. data. So um, essentially a uh, big thing in uh, geophysics is uh, the data. Uh, what makes uh, the challenge of geophysics is that you don't often have like a ground ground truth um, in many locations because it's very expensive to like drill wells and uh, measure properties of the rocks. Um, but um, there are um, some wells uh, near where I can, can test and then measure um, if these uh, these changes I'm uh, making to the data um, correspond to uh, the correct locations of, of the rock layers from from well measurements. Uh, so that's another uh, thing to do. Um, and then finally, uh, another thing I'm going to work on is uh, generating uh, ultra far offset. Uh, synthetics. Um, so, so here, here I just did uh, near, near mid and far offset, but there's, there's also um, ultra far offset, which should be like over 36 degrees for the reflection angles inside the waves. So, I could uh, reformulate this problem using uh, a quadruplet of traces instead of a triplet um, that could provide more information. Uh, so, so that's, that's the uh, end of my uh, presentation. I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting me to this talk and uh, also to my uh, collaborators uh, on this project who are uh, Vaymond, uh, Andreas, Aina, and Johan Eric at uh, AquaBP and uh, UIO. So thank you. Thank you all for the very nice presentation. Uh, I have a few questions that I will ask, and then I will move to the others if uh, anyone else has any questions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my first question is related to the simulation that you do. So, like, uh, could you just comment on how much time does the simulation take? Because I would expect it's not very intensive as compared to images, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, this uh, synthetic generation. generation um, each of these actually only takes about a, a second to generate um, and because it's uh, essentially just uh, randomly sampling um, uh, amplitude values and looping over 
the, uh, the, the time, time and the, the offset. Um, so, so it's all, all it's all uh, one dimensional. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, you, you mentioned something in the future work related to uh, making it more realistic, realistic right? right? Uh, is there any way that you can do quality control just to check that the data that you have looks like it's realistic, even though you cannot make it like hundred percent realistic for that? Are there any quality control measures that you can see you can use to like um, exclude some data points that you think are not valid? Uh, yeah, 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 that would be. Uh, I, I think essentially you have to do it kind of by by eye. Um, I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure if there's, there's a way, way to uh, uh, quantitatively say, say yeah, like, oh, oh, this is like a really good, but essentially I want to, you know, make it look more like this, like, this, like field data. data. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have one more question, but I will uh, ask anyone else if anyone else has any questions that I will ask them. I had a question. Uh, when you introduced your uh, solution with machine learning, uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, is there any conventional method to solve this problem? And what was, if yes, what is the advantage of your work compared with the conventional one? Yeah, yeah so, so there is a, a uh, conventional, conventional method, method um, which is called Turing Stacks. And essentially, that involves um, taking, uh, computing the, the cross correlation uh, between um, these uh, different traces. The cross correlation is a way to measure the time shift um, between two uh, time signals. So they compute uh, cross correlations over certain windows and then uh, shift it back up to, uh, to align with it. Um, but, but the, uh, the, uh, the limitation of that is there's like a lot of, uh, uh, it's, it's highly sensitive to the, the parameters, like the, like the window size of the correlation. Um, so it takes a lot of like trial and error to, to get it right for a specific data set. Um, so my goal is to gen uh, develop like a generalized network that can, uh, um, require less uh, parameter selection for that. Um, and then also there's a more fundamental um, way that I think uh, like a good machine learning method would be better. And that's, um, it's not, and that's the fact that it's not only like time shifts because essentially with, with uh, incorrect NMO, you have these uh, reflectors um, bending down or upwards with with offset, and then at the far offsets they can interfere with each other. So uh, you know, like destructive interference of uh, signals. Um, the example is like you know sound waves, um, like your noise canceling headphones. Um, so different signals when they interfere you can change the the amplitude um, in a way that. Uh, isn't uh, representative, representative of reality. So uh, my, my network, network is uh, also trying to um, correct for some of this destructive interference in the amplitudes um, in order to um, give a more realistic uh, example of amplitudes. Well, the trim stacks is essentially just shifting in time. So thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we are running, running a bit out of time, so I'll ask my question really quick, uh, and, and you can like answer very briefly. Uh, in the architecture that you have, you use the three signals together and get the three signals out, right? Mm -hmm. Do you expect to have any benefit from using this approach instead of uh, feeding each one of those three separately? Like, do you expect any interaction effects or some information that, like, do you expect one of those? Uh, measurements, measurements to help in the prediction of the other ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the way, way I have this, this uh, set, I should mentioned it. Um, it is like a, it's a like a three-channel um, input, but doing doing one-dimensional convolutions. So, um, 
it is like, like taking, taking um, the, the entire triplet, triplet but treating it at a, a, a channelized uh, basis. So, so I, I, I think it is, um, I, I, I have tried, tried it um, going from just far to far, like, like one, one trace to one trace, trace and, and the results are, are, are not as good. good. So, so I, I think, think it is, um, you, you want, want to include the other offset information, information when you do this uh, transformation because it is ultimately all kind of related going across. So. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we don't have any more questions, I think uh, we can end off the session here. So I would like to thank Federica and Alon again for the very nice presentation. And, and also, also thanks, thanks my uh, colleagues as well online. And, and uh, yeah, see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.